This is the Digital Savage Experience Podcast, hosted by Roman Prokopchuk, bringing you all things digital marketing, tech, business, and motivation. What's stopping you from becoming relentless in all aspects of life? Are you ready to become a digital savage? Let's get into today's episode. Hey everyone, this is Roman Prokopchuk and this is the Digital Savage Experience Podcast. Today I have with me Roland Sibelink. Roland is a 25-year veteran of the internet business, entrepreneurship, and digital marketing. He's seen three companies and taken them from 10 to 1,000 employees in three years' time. So he has that intricate knowledge of how to scale a company into a a massive level. Thank you for joining me today. Absolutely. Thank you, Roman, for the invitation. My pleasure. So tell me a little bit about your journey. Where did you start and how did you get to where you are now? Well, let's first get the uh, awkward thing out of the way. I have a funny accent and that's because I come from the Netherlands. That's where I was born. And, um, you know, in the uh, 70s and 80s, I grew up there and then quickly I went to college in uh, Brussels. Um, This was right around the time when uh, new media were very much in vogue. So we were moving away from uh, TV, radio being the the reference of everything and moving to new media like CD-ROM and also internet. And I was very lucky to be one of the first people to uh, be investigating and working with the internet especially from a non-technical perspective. So, of course, many engineers were excited about it, but I basically got to it from a social sciences perspective and a communication studies background. And so this led me to be asked to be one of the first co-founders of the first uh, website company in Belgium. Uh, Did a lot of research also on what would drive adoption of uh, this newfangled technology. And in 1996, I was very lucky to be asked to roll out the very first consumer broadband internet products all over Europe uh, for a company called Telenet. And that was uh, an immense success. It was the first of my uh, three major growth stories, starting all the way from a company that was just eight people at the time that grew into a company of a thousand people three and a half years later. Um, And I think the key that I, I found there is that, you know, setting that goal and setting your sights high on a big consumer market, even if it was only in its infancy at the time we started, was the key to success. And also the thing I, I learned from that was a company that grows so fast is almost like you're in a, in a movie that goes in fast forward. So you can see all the changes that typically happen uh, in a course of 10, 20 years. You can now see them happen in one or two years. And so there's a lot to be learned upon, learned from there uh, just in terms of management and leadership and how a company operates and how how people make good decisions and bad decisions and what the, what the consequences are. That's great. And uh, being kind of uh, part of those three events, have you seen or what have you seen in terms of commonalities, some of the, uh, the mistakes that those three had or some of the things that they may have all done uh, well? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I think the first common point is the initial starting position or the product that led to initial success was a very clear value proposition that was not just 10 times, but maybe 100 times better than whatever competing alternative there was. So for Telenet in the 1990s, uh, it was broadband internet, which we all know was vastly superior to the old dial-up modems that happened to be there at the time. Remember the (laughs) sounding uh, things that you would have to do to dial in. Um, And then the second one was Blue Wind in Switzerland, which made particularly good content experience for people uh, providing full ports to all the information out there on the web that was so much superior to having to Google everything or, or whatever the alternative at that point in time was. The third one was uh, rocket fuel in uh, the US uh, between uh, 2011 and 2016, I was there. And they offered the very first online advertising that was driven by artificial intelligence. In other words, the computers helped place the right ads in front of the right people at the right moment, vastly superior to all the manual placement that happened until then. And so I think the key commonality there is start off with a product that just offers a vastly superior experience 
uh, compared to uh, any competitors that happen to be there at the time. Uh, the other thing I would say is that sticking to that core value proposition and really focusing on it is actually a recipe for success. The challenge and the, um, uh, the, the problem I would say is that often the people that have launched these projects are by nature inventors and so you know their product is in the market they get a little bit bored with having to run a sales force and recruiting everyone and starting to run a larger and larger maybe a little bit more bureaucratic organization and so what they'd love to do is to come up with a second product or a third product and keep inventing stuff and in my mind i've seen very often how that starts distracting the whole organization starts making it a lot less agile and a lot more bureaucratic and therefore, I've uh, typically been advising founders ever since to stick with their core knitting, if you will, and make that first product a full success rather than to start second and third business lines too early. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, founding a company or any kind of a, a business, whether it's uh, you know consumer-based or anything else, uh, having that core value or a core, core start and getting to it and getting it really good and then getting the most out of it and then as you're growing, possibly where it's where you want it to be, you know, top of mm -hmm. market, then, you know, go and innovate because that innovation component, you know, once that's gotten to a point, you can, you know, revolutionize it. And I think a lot of companies, they get very big. I mean, the Fortune 500 companies that were, you know, in the Fortune 500 50 years ago, many of those aren't there today. Absolutely. So they get to a point, they think, you know, they're too big to fail. They stop innovating, stop mm -hmm. kind of thinking or having that cr uh, creativity to, you know, take it to the next level and that ultimately um, takes them down. Yeah, and I think uh, too few founders are aware of uh, how important this difference in the kind of people is. I mean, I do think most founders uh, get intuitively that their companies are staffed with typically smarter people than the corporations, or at least that's how they think about it. I think what they don't uh, really identify that clearly is why is it that this startup feels so much smarter than uh, that big corporation they're competing against. And really, it's all a function of complexity. The big corporation may have uh, 20 different sales channels across 50 different countries with run, each running 10 different product lines. And so to keep all of these things together is a very complex and very time consuming. In other words, they're not agile anymore. A startup is very agile just because there's only a few people around the table, one product, one target market. You can make very clear and very compelling decisions very quickly. That's exactly why I typically advise them against launching secondary business lines or moving international too quickly or all these other uh, extra dimensions they could have because actually what they're doing is losing their big competitive advantage against that corporation by turning themselves into an equally complex organization way too soon. Does that make sense? No, it makes sense. I often kind of give the example of uh, they get to a point where they're, they're like the Titanic and think they're kind of too big to sink. And then something comes along that uh, completely destroys it. Or even like a, like the Titanic example, they're so big that they're not, like you said, agile enough to pivot mm -hmm. as fast as a startup would. Yeah, absolutely. And so what we have to tell startup founders is try not to become the Titanic yourself too quickly. You know what I mean? <laughs> you first have to conquer your market before you can start adding bulk and fat and um, complexity. And many founders try to do that too early uh, out of uh, maybe a sense of hubris when their first product has been so successful. And uh, typically I find that the more they can keep very concentrated and only focus on the cherry picking of those areas that work best, the more successful they will be over time. No, I agree. So what motivates you to succeed? You know, I think uh, for me, it really is about that can-do spirit that founders have in changing the world. I mean, a lot of people joke about Silicon Valley, where I live, always talking about, oh, we're going to change the world, we're going to make the world a better place. And, you know, a lot of it is what should I call it? A little bit uh, overhyped for sure, but still a good founder has this passion to fix something they see broken in the world. And we have to realize that almost all improvements that we have experienced as a society ultimately came from founders that took some new technology and turned it into a marketable product, the proper 
uh, definition of innovation, right? To make something marketable that was only available in a lab before. And so I am really motivated by helping these founders realize their vision, uh, really improve something into the world, no matter how small it is, and helping them avoid the big traps that they may experience on the way. Most founders have no clear management education or management experience or leadership experience. And so they may intuitively take decisions that lead their company astray or that lead them directly into a trap. Since I've been so lucky to go through that process already three times in a company that I worked for, it's much easier for me to help keep them on the right path and make sure that that vision actually succeeds and that new company becomes a part of, um, of, of whatever is going better in our world. No, I agree. I think it's important to have someone in a mentor role or an advisory role to kind of, like you said, steer people in the right direction and, uh, you know, accelerate that growth because obviously if they can uh, avoid some of the pain points mm -hmm. that you can uh, talk to them about that you've experienced in the past and they can navigate around it, they can get to the, uh, the goal at hand a lot faster and smoother. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, my role when, when working with them is not to tell them what to do. They, they have all the answers. What they often don't have is the right questions to ask themselves. And so that's where I try to help them uh, ask those right questions and then provide better answers so that they keep uh, moving full speed ahead towards their vision. Yeah, it's basically you're, you're steering them and they obviously, like you said, know, know that um, where they want to get. It's kind of a, like a therapist. Someone comes to talk to a therapist. Ultimately, they're solving their own problem. But they're there's, there's a lot to be said and a lot of comparisons. Uh, but I do think a therapist uh, in, the, in the traditional sense is more focused on the past. Um, and I like to focus very much on the future. So no matter what has happened to you uh, before and no matter what mistakes you've made, how can you now focus all your efforts and your energy on building that better future you envision? That's really my goal. And uh, the other thing I often say is, you know, many founders are afraid of working with a coach or a facilitator because they feel like, ah, they're just gonna want to talk about my problems and I don't wanna really delve into that. And I say, you know, my, fo my real focus is not putting you on a sofa and let you, let you cry or something. My focus is the bottom line. And so it's all in the function of how do we make this into a successful company that can sustain itself for years and years to come. No, I agree yeah. uh, <laughs> that it's funny that you kind of uh, took that away from the therapist's angle. Because I think <laughs> if, you, if you identified yourself as a therapist, you would have uh, a lot of other things you know, brought to you in terms of you know, like emotional capacity, that kind of thing from uh, some of these companies. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's, you cannot deny that, of course, um, every founder is a human being and has their emotions. And sometimes you will have these tearful moments or there's a problem with their family and it needs to be solved because otherwise the, the company will fail because of it. But still, it shouldn't be the first focus. And I think that's where I like to distinguish myself a little bit from your typical executive coach who comes maybe from more of a psychology background, an HR background, and invariably is focused only on that one person and trying to help make them do better. But what I've found is that it doesn't really matter if you convince a CEO that they need to do certain things differently if the whole team around them is not involved in that change. You know, the typical pattern would be a CEO that is very much a micromanager because, you know, that's what made them successful in the early stages of the startup. Now they need to learn to let go. Almost every executive coach will tell them, you know, this may be something you want to work on. But as soon as that CEO comes back to their team and somebody comes to them with a problem and he says, well, what do you think? Or you solve it. The other person goes in panic because they've been used to that CEO solving all their problems for them. So the only way you can affect real change in a fast developing startup like that is to have the whole team involved to discuss those changes they need as a team and to all agree to let's do certain things differently, thereby also liberating that CEO from not having to manage all of the details on a day by day basis. Does that make sense? Yeah, I agree, because I think if you're just uh, addressing the problem with kind of, you know, the head or a C-suite level, you still have to obviously worry about the rest of the uh, org chart. And if you're not involving them in the solution, it, it's, it's going to continue to be a problem. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I often ask um, when I first start working with a, with a startup team, 
I will ask the CEO in our first workshop, can you please just do one thing? Try not to be the first one to speak. Ideally, I'd like you to be the last one to speak whenever a question comes up. And uh, they look at me a little bit funny because they suddenly start realizing they're always the first to speak, you know? And then that no one else has, has a good place for their opinion anymore. And then typically what happens after an hour or so in, they start feeling this big sense of relief. I can just see them relaxing more, uh, sitting back in their chair a little bit more, enjoying the conversations going on around them. And by lunchtime, typically they come to me and say, you know, this is very weird, very funny, but, you know, I thought Joyce was um, my worst executive and I've been so impressed with all the contributions she's been making this morning and her thinking, I had no idea. Whereas Ralph, I thought of him as my best guy and I haven't seen him contribute anything this morning. I don't know what's going on. Does he have a bad day or something? And of course, they suddenly start realizing Joyce has just been afraid to speak up in the past versus Ralph has been very good at aping whatever the CEO was saying and always agreeing with them. And that, I think, needs to come out in a team to make it more of a team of equals where they can have a proper debate, commit to something together, and then move the company forward together. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, it's it's better oftentimes to sit there and wait and get everybody else's, you know, perspective or feelings before making, you know, an initial statement about something. And I think uh, it's important for like a team to have kind of the comfort, uh, comfort level to be able to obviously not vent to a crazy extent because of, you know, obviously there's HR issues and stuff in a company, <laughs> sure. but at least be honest, you know, because oftentimes employees on every level don't want to necessarily be honest to their, you know, direct, uh, the person they report to mm -hmm. based on either fear of, you know, some kind of uh, repercussion or losing their job or like a negative review. Mm -hmm. So I think voicing an opinion and if idea or a direct, uh, a direction is being taken that they don't agree with, you know, stating that, but then having the, um, kind of the emotional IQ, not to say, you know, this idea is horrible, but, you know, this isn't going to work because X, Y, Z, and this is how maybe we can, you know, alleviate it and, and move in the right direction. Absolutely. Yeah, you, you, have, to, you have that summarized really, uh, really correctly. And, you know, in the meanwhile, we've now gotten some interesting research that they did at, uh, at Google, um, where they tried to find whatever factors were making a team the most uh, successful in, in their performance targets. And yeah, as it usually goes, they, they looked at so many factors. They found very few that had a proper correlation. So there was no correlation between how well people had performed on their job interviews. There was no correlation with what great school they came from. Um, there was no correlation with how much management training they had been following. All of these traditional cures were essentially proven invalid. But the one thing that made a team perform really well was this sense of safety in the team, psychological safety, where to your point, Roman, people could speak up and felt like they would be heard, even if their opinion was maybe a little bit counter to the majority opinion or the opinion of their boss. And so instituting that sense of psychological safety in a, in a management team is often my very first um, assignment or my first task that I set myself. How can we get people to feel safe, to contribute, to challenge each other, and to get to a better solution in the end that everyone agrees with? Yeah, I agree. It, it adds to kind of the, the well-being of the company. And regardless, obviously, if they're headquarters somewhere or all together in, in one location, multiple locations or remote, it's only going to make the, uh, the job experience that much uh, better and the morale, you know, stay high regardless of the situation. Because, I mean, you're spending mm -hmm. a large portion of your life at work with people oh, yeah. around you. So you have to be able to communicate and then voice what's bothering you. You know, and even, you know, praise other employees around you that have done a great job. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you bring up a remote uh, as well, because that's such a big trend right now that I see, particularly with technology companies, that companies are basically um, having more and more people that they hire that do not report into any particular office. Or some companies go 100% remote. 
one of my bigger clients has now decided to even close their head office in Madison, Wisconsin and say everyone just works from home or a coffee shop or a co co-working place, whatever they like. We even fund that, but no more offices, you know, and um, that does pose its particular challenges in how do you then get that team to bond and to feel like one team, even if they're almost never in the same location. Um, some of these companies do a great job at then compensating for that remote um, working culture by bringing the top team together every quarter in one location where they can really bond and do workshops together but also have a you know have a laugh and a drink and a, and a dinner together um, and some other companies um, even uh, you know are able to do remote workshops where everyone just dials in and we still have that proper management discussion, but without the need for people to actually come to a single place and, uh, and be in the same room together. So I think this is a very new trend. We're still all investigating what's going to happen, but I'm, I'm very keen to be working with those remote companies because I absolutely think it's the trend of the future. Yeah, I agree. And it's a great way to uh, tap, tap top talent outside of your you know, geographic region of your, where your office is or where you're headquartered. So obviously if you're, you know, in tech and you may be, I don't know, obviously you may not be in like South Dakota or somewhere, but obviously if the remote, the role is remote, you may, you know, find somebody that fits and is willing to obviously invest in the opportunity to work for your company from, mm -hmm. you know, a major tech hub like, you know, California or New York or any other places in the US or even uh, globally. Absolutely. Um, you know, and uh, I would say from, from the context I've had with um, my client and other remote companies, as soon as they've dared to hire their first uh, remote employees, they're never going back because now suddenly the whole world is their oyster. As you say, you can get talent from anywhere and they're the best people. Talent is distributed uh, equally across the globe, but opportunity is not, right? So um, how can you then justify fishing in only one pond if the entire world's ocean is available to you? That's, that's what I see. They just can't go back anymore. And then it's just a matter of how do you then manage that team uh, remotely that's of course the big adaptation for traditional managers they cannot imagine that they're they're unable to control what people do in their time because they cannot see on their desks or something like that but you know I think we all know that that's really an old-fashioned management style anyway and it's not bringing us anywhere in this world of uh, of knowledge workers and uh, and highly uh, highly specialized talents yeah, I agree. I, you know, I've been fully remote for about three years now, mm -hmm. coming from an office setting or like a corporate setting. The biggest company I've worked for had 50,000 employees and then, you know, agencies that may have 100, 200 to now fully remote. It's just it's it's very um, kind of uh, liberating on the employee side as well, because you're uh, saving so much time, especially in the area that uh, I'm at. So in the kind of New York tri-state area, I would either be working in Philadelphia or New York City and commuting like an hour and a half, two hours each way on a train mm -hmm. or by car. So I'm saving at least, you know, three to four hours a day on commuting. So that value of time is, you know, intrinsic and, you know, anyone that's remote appreciates that time. And obviously it's your most valuable commodity. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I've, I started this company about three years ago. Um, I, I just called it after myself, Roland Sibling Group, and we are almost 10 people now. And I was shocked the other day to realize we're already on five continents. No, that's great. <laughs> so, you know, that's, uh, that it just comes naturally these days. Why would you even try and rent an office? It's just not done anymore, I guess, right? If you're in tech and everyone is comfortable using Slack and Zoom and typical technologies, uh, it just seems more efficient. Yeah, most most problems or, you know, things to solve can be addressed via, like you said, a video conference or a phone call. But if, you know, a meeting, a meeting is needed, you can fly into, you know, a client site or you can meet somewhere mutually. And all you have to really do is, you know, rent a conference room in a co-working space or another mm -hmm. facility. And that's all you're really using that room for rather than, you know, rent a whole office building and, you know, everything else that comes with it. Absolutely. With, uh, with my remote uh, uh, only company clients, uh, I, did, I developed actually recently kind of like a remote company maturity model that we also 
help uh, we, we went through with them to see where were their gaps against the most ideal remote companies. And what we found is indeed where you said recruiting anywhere is the very first step on that competency or maturity model. And then typically remote companies as a second step have to realize, okay, now we need to do a conscious bonding activities, right? So things like assigning people a buddy when they uh, get recruited by the company so that they always have people to talk to, setting up uh, extra many video calls in the beginning of people's uh, trajectory in that company. And also what you often see remote companies do is organize a trip once a year where everyone gets together, uh, be it in a location or on a cruise ship so that they can actually bond. So this conscious bonding is really important. And then as a next step that my client is still working on is to move away from just synchronous meetings for problem solving and to move more into how can we solve problems asynchronously. That means by stating them in documents and everyone everyone work through comments and through uh, change requests to documents rather than always having to be on Zoom at the same time. And I'm really excited about developing this model further with my client and other remote companies because as I say, it's something we're inventing as we go along. So bringing all that knowledge together is gonna be crucial for remote companies to be as successful as their uh, physical counterparts. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, oftentimes like standing meetings are a big bottleneck and the usefulness of, you know, how you use your time. So addressing certain things that may require, you know, 10 meetings and 100 emails have some kind of format structure where you identify the problem and, you know, this is the time frame and everybody works in some kind of formal, like structured way to, you know, reach that solution. Mm hmm. The uh, Sid, the founder of GitLab, one of the biggest remote companies, he always says, you know, you may think you work for a traditional company like Google. You, you take your bus in the morning and it brings you to the Mountain View campus. And then you have eight hours of meetings where you're on Zoom all the time because everyone else is dialing in. Congratulations, you have a remote job anyway. You're just combining it with a commute, you know? <laughs> What's the point? Yeah, I agree. So what's one thing that you may have had as a weakness in the past that you've turned around and utilized as a strength today? Uh, that's such a great question. Um, I would say I can be pretty critical and blunt with people, although I've often combined that with um, a fear of uh, full conflict. So I still want to then be harmonious with that person. And that's been a really weird character flaw, I would say. But I have now started to really use that as part of my coaching and facilitation activity that I think more than other people, I am comfortable with making a point or asking a question that really brings up the elephant in the room or the point that nobody wants to talk about. So that at least we make it a topic for discussion that everyone can see, that everyone can needs to confront. And then I'm still working very much with either the individual that I'm talking to or the team that I'm talking to. Now, how do we solve this? How do we get back into a harmonious state where we all agree that one, we've solved this issue and we're all happy with that. So maybe that bluntness or sense of critiquing was something that I needed to turn around into becoming a good coach and facilitator. Yeah, I think with experience and time and, uh, you know, becoming a veteran in a, in a uh, career or a, obviously, as you get older in life, you get more of a uh, emotional intelligence where even if you are critical, you can kind of massage it a little bit better. And uh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Yes. Uh, are you telling me I'm old? No, I mean, I'm saying, I mean, I just <laughs> turned 35 uh -huh. uh, August 18th. And um, basically the way I would have dealt with a professional problem is a lot different than if I was uh, 25 versus 35, where that kind of those trials and kind of tribulations and all the things I've mm -hmm. seen in my professional career and the types of people I've dealt, I learned to, you know, address in a different manner because I know everyone doesn't think the same. And in the workplace, there's different personalities, there's mm -hmm. different things, how people react to something um, and basically listening better and thinking of the, the other person and what they may be going through on a professional or personal level. 
Absolutely, I have the same experience. I, I sometimes wonder if if I met myself like I was uh, in my 20s, if I would uh, like myself or hate myself. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I don't know about hate, but I would definitely, uh, you know, sit down for, you know, 10, 12 hours and trying to give some kind of guidance in terms of what you uh, should be doing at that age. Absolutely. And, and that's actually the interesting thing that even at that age, people are actually quite open to guidance, right? Um, what they don't necessarily like is corrections or feedback because nobody likes to be told what to do. But if you truly offer guidance with the interest of the person at heart, understanding where they want to go and then help them get there, that's something that people crave in my experience. Yeah, I agree. It's kind of positioning it. It's, uh, you know, giving advice versus kind of, uh, you know, critiquing or shouting out like what you should change or, you know, different demands. Yeah, especially if the if the critique you're giving is basically coming from whatever your experience is and that experience may not be helpful to that person whatsoever. So I think the very first step is always put yourself in the shoes of the other person, try to understand where they want to go and then help them get there. What you want is actually irrelevant, right? <laughs> yeah, I agree. So what's one piece of advice you can leave with the audience, either personal or professional? Well, I would say the kind of companies I work with, the fast growing startups, so startups that have hit on something and uh, you know now it's really about um, monetizing that market. My key advice to them is understand you're no longer a typical startup. You have to let go of some of the behaviors that made you successful as a startup. For example, changing your plans all the time or uh, being very micromanaging as a CEO that is absolutely required in the very early stage. But as soon as you start growing, those are some habits you need to shed. And at the same time, I would say also do not try to be like a mature company from the get go, because just like as a kid has to go through puberty and adolescence in order to become a fully fledged adult, the company has to go through this whole scaling phase before it became, becomes its own uh, mature company in its own dominant marketplace. That can take four or five, maybe even 10 years before you can start behaving like a, like a mature and, um, and stable company. And so be aware that there's a whole specific body of knowledge around how do you scale a company? How do you keep up momentum that is different from the typical startup advice it's also very different from the typical advice for mature companies and i would say that's the key thing that i want founders to realize that's why i travel around the world and talk in all these co-working spaces to make sure founders hear that before they make the wrong steps yeah i agree that's very interesting in terms of kind of human development you properly kind of hitting each phase and and develop developing the skill set and kind of you know developing your brain the the way it should be in terms of you know becoming a productive adult and obviously some people in their lives have traumatic experiences in those parts of their life that affect the kind of the final or working product in adulthood so i think it's important like you said not to necessarily you know rush through um mm -hmm. and basically hit each stage and develop that skill set or what you have and and as a plan to learn within that kind of development stage and then move over and hopefully get to a point of profitability be profitability and uh, maturity in terms of a company absolutely like the way you voice it is is even better than than what i was trying to say uh, thank you for that it's all about building up these new competences and these new areas of mastery if you will and that's that's so comparable in my mind to a kid going through adolescence and then maybe their college education where it's all about learning and knowing yourself better and knowing what you're really good at and getting getting to that level of mastery that allows you to then function as a fully independent adult over time just like a fully independent company over time yeah i agree like, I, that's why i like doing interviews so i can mm -hmm. kind of connect the dots as i'm listening to responses and then you know, tailor like the connections that I'm actually making. So I'm learning as I'm interviewing. Absolutely. And, you know, maybe that's the other answer I could give uh, to your question uh, of, of one piece of professional advice. You know, a lot of people ask me, like, am I in the right career? Should I be making more money? Uh, should I be in a different field? And 
you know, I think when you're in your 20s, you try to sketch out your life plan and you want to be very controlling about it, but life just doesn't follow your plan that easily in my nope. experience. And so, you know, I usually use the metaphor of it's more like you're, you're in a fast flowing river and, you know, it's going to drag you to the end point no matter what. All you can hope to do is maybe sometimes hold on to a branch or a stone or, you know, move yourself one meter or yard to the left or the right uh, to, to steer yourself a little bit. Um, and if you have that in mind, then you don't need to be so controlling. But then the key thing is, are you still swimming? Are you still learning, right? And, and I love that you say, you know, these interviews are a way of, of learning for you because whenever people ask me, am I in the right job? Should I leave? Should I move? Uh, it's all about, are you still learning? If you're no longer learning, you probably should move no matter what the salary is. Um, and if you are learning, then you may very well still be in the right position. Yeah, I agree. And I think obviously life is going to happen regardless, you know, a smooth oh, yeah. road or a rocky one. <laughs> And like, you know, recommendations for an individual or a company, it's never going to happen as you plan. You can plan all you want. Something is going to come out of nowhere that, you know, is going to test you and it's how you deal with it and uh, move past it. Absolutely. And I do think, you know, like having a, a bit of a vision of where you want to go over time is, of course, great. And every company needs that, too. It's just how can you combine being maybe a little bit stubborn or um, solid about that vision with them being very agile in how to get there. It's like pointing out a mountaintop at the horizon, like I want to climb that mountain over time, but you know, I can't see all the paths and all the, all the roads leading there. I can't see the traffic. I can't see the, the gorges that I need to overcome. So we'll just find our way there. And that's how the metaphor I like to use with companies too. have a very clear long-term goal in mind, but be very agile about how to get there. No, I agree. So I really appreciate you uh, stopping by today. Can you let the audience know how they can find you? Yes, the easiest one is to go to the website that's also the title of my book. It's scalingsiliconvalleystyle.com. And on that website, they can also find uh, a freebie, some, uh, some free chapters from the book and some extra workshop materials that all help founders of fast growing companies do a better job at aligning their team setting the right long-term targets and getting that culture of alignment and uh, debate going that allows them to free up their own time. Awesome. Thanks again for stopping by. Thank you so much, Roman. I much appreciate the invitation and uh, much uh, good luck with uh, the podcast. Hey everyone, this is Roman Prokopchuk from Roman Prokopchuk's Digital Savage Experience Podcast. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free, so that's always good. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. This podcast has been brought to you by Nova Zora Digital. Find out how Nova Zora Digital can help your company grow online. Learn more at NovaZoraDigital.com.